you're live. Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to this talk and thanks for being here. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I will be talking a bit about uh, the work I've been doing on visual inertial tracking for Monado and how I've been leveraging like different research systems from academia and integrating them into Monaro. Okay, so first a bit, a bit of background for me. I'm Matteo De Maggio. I started working on Collabora uh, last year, on July. Uh, I started doing an internship, a six-month internship, uh, working precisely on this, on visual inertial tracking. And the work I did for this internship was also the work for my thesis for my computer science degree at FAMAF, uh, the National University of Cordoba, Argentina. Uh, in general, you can find me online as Mateo SSS or Mateo De Maggio, and I let in the slides some links to uh, things like my blog and my YouTube channel that I sometimes upload things related to visual inertial tracking that you might be interesting, interested in. Okay, so uh, I'll start by trying to explain what I mean with visual inertial tracking because the, there's a lot of problems with terminology in the area, so I will try to distill this a bit. So, tracking in general is knowing the pose, which is the position and the orientation of some real-world entity. It can be anything. It can be uh, tracking your eyes, tracking your hands, tracking your foot, or in the case we are looking at, tracking the, the viewer of the XR experience. The viewer might be the head, if you're using a headset, or a phone, for example, tracking where a phone is if you're using uh, an, like an augmented reality application, uh, glasses, and so on. So, more specifically, even, I will talk about uh, a VR headset in general because that's the thing I'm most familiar with and the thing I've been testing all of this stuff uh, mostly on. So, um, why vision inertial tracking is important? Well, just not so long, not so long, uh, sorry, not so long ago, we had uh, many commercial devices, commercial headsets that came with external sensors and that was kind of like the mainstream way of doing uh, tracking, like uh, six degrees of freedom tracking. Uh, you can think of the Oculus Constellation devices in which you had to put two cameras in front of you or the Lighthouse, uh, lighthouse trackers for the Valve Index. Um, in general, those systems work pretty well. The problem is that external sensors are annoying in many senses. Uh, first of all, they take a lot of space, a lot of cables and, and like just in the box of the device you're buying. Uh, there's also the problem that you need to calibrate them as a an user, which is annoying. and and also they add, uh, they add to the costs of the devices in general. So right now we are having the kind of like the last years the industry has been moving forward uh, towards the using what we will call inside out tracking. Uh, this is also a term that is kind of co controversial, but let's call it inside out tracking for now. Uh, the idea is that you put all of the sensors in the headset and you use these sensors to track uh, around. And again, we are doing visual inertial tracking. That means that we are, will be using visual sensors uh, th those are cameras, and inertial sensors, those are uh, IMUs. So, cameras are basically things that take images, uh, as you know them, they are basically high latency and low frequency, you usually have like, uh, you can think of 30 frames per second that you get from these cameras, and they're high latency because an image is a very big stuff, a very big uh, chunk of memory that you need to pass through USB or something, and Compared to that, we have IMUs, with, which are inertial measurement units. Uh, these are basically a, a combination of an accelerometer for measuring linear acceleration in the three degrees, and a an gyroscope for measuring angular velocity in the three degrees, in the three uh, dimensions. And in contrast to the cameras, these are very low latency and high frequency because you only have like six uh, numbers to pass uh, for uh, measurement are just six numbers and usually get like uh, IMUs with about 1,000 measurements per second. So the nice thing about using these two sensors is that they complement each other pretty well. Uh, so what do I mean with this? In general, IMUs being so fast, you the, the nice thing about having low latency and, and high frequency is that they react very well to your movements. They feel pretty well in the sense that uh, you don't have latency but they tend to drift very easily as they are proprioceptive measurements. They, they add up some error over time when you integrate the, the measurement over time. And so cameras are kind of, kind of essential to counteract this, to be able to say, okay, I moved to this way and be able to see how you, the, the, the external environment changed and to have a more precise uh, idea of how did you move in reality. So kind of like the idea is to use the IMU for short periods of time and then correct the, the, the drift that the IMU uh, accumulates over time with the camera's uh, measurements. 
this is kind of like an analogy to what we do in like uh, what how biology works. Like we have uh, eyes, which will be like our cameras, and we have a receiver system in our eyes, which kind of works like an IMU. And the the thing of doing this, uh, integrating these two sensors, the, the, the way or, or the name of integrating sensors to, to estimate the pulse is called sensor, sensor fusion. And there are two main ways of doing sensor fusion. One, uh, one, of that way, uh, one way is doing common filtering, and the other is nonlinear optimization. Uh, common filtering is very good for sensor fusion in general, but uh, there is a paper, a very nice paper that I link in the slides that has shown that uh, non optimization has some benefits uh, regarding computational uh, times. Uh, and, and so the research area of, of visual inertial tracking has moved towards nonlinear optimization lately. Even though there are still uh, some common filtering systems that are pretty good, but in general, uh, non optimization has been the way to go. Some terminology, uh, SLAM, visual inertial SLAM, visual inertial telemetry, structure for motion, all of these have some overlap and it's kind of tricky to, to pinpoint exactly what we are doing to being just slam because we are not doing just slam. In fact, what I will present today is not full slam because we are not doing proper uh, persistent mapping. It's more like vision inertial odometry, but we also have some slam support. So I'll just say vision inertial tracking in general, and that's the name I will be giving it. Okay, so the internship project. The internship project was basically, uh, we had some trackers in Monado. We still have the PlayStation VR, PlayStation Move, uh, three degrees of freedom, the T265 for North Star. Uh, that's basically, a, 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 that's the T265 is pretty interesting because it's basically a device, a camera that has two cameras and name inside and does uh, vision inertial tracking inside the device. So you just ask for the pose, but you don't have access to the algorithm that is running inside. Um, we also had lighthouse tracking uh, for the bulb index and uh, HTC Vive and so on. Uh, but in general, we didn't have any kind of inside instead of support for all of these new headsets that have been coming, uh, so we couldn't support them. So the, the plan was relatively simple. Uh, we saw that the research field was very active. Uh, we, there were a lot of systems coming, and I mean a lot of systems out there uh, that do SLAM or vision inertial geometry. And the idea was to, okay, let's just pick one of those and use it, it should be easy. Um, of course, it wasn't. Uh, there are really too many systems out there and the papers are kind of, of course, they're kind of biased because, of course, I'm publishing a system. I will highlight the pros of these systems, uh, of my, the system I did. Uh, so yeah, the, it's kind of difficult to read between lines when you're new to the, to the area. And research software in general can be problematic. Uh, the objective of research software uh, is to publish, is to have metrics for your system. And so you run your system on the standard data sets and that's kind of it sometimes. Your system might not be very well prepared to new devices, new sensors and so on. So uh, systems can be a bit brittle and they can take a lot of effort to just get, it, get them to build. Kind of like a, a summary, summary of things I, I think I ended up looking at, like key points I try to, to, to look for in these systems, I think would be D6. I looked at how many different sensor configurations they supported. Like, did they support uh, two cameras and an IMU, two cameras only, one camera and an IMU, for example, if we want to support phones, uh, just one camera or more than two cameras, and so on. Like, how many uh, different configurations they supported. Uh, the license, the license is pretty important. Uh, there is a lot of GPL out there. The problem is that that's not very compatible with what we want from Monado. Uh, we would uh, like to have a permissive license to be able to bring code for the system into Monado or just in general be able to allow the programmer to do whatever they want with it, even sell the system if they want. Um, active maintainers, that is super important. Uh, so yeah, it would be nice to be able to ask to the, to the project and get a response like if you have, an, if you have some problems. Uh, a lot of these systems get done for uh, publishing a paper and then they get abandoned. Of course, like uh, they do a PhD and the life moves on and the systems gets uh, in the dark. Uh, software quality, again, uh, research software, software quality is important, it's not easy to find. Uh, performance, it should run fast, like uh, we are aiming to run hopefully these things in uh, like very small, like very constrained devices at some point. And the tracking quality, kind of very important, we want the tracking efforts to feel good and, and to be accurate enough. 
Uh, all of these, we ended up integrating three systems, Chimera VIO, Orphan 3, and Basalt. Chimera VIO uh, looked pretty nice. It has a MIT, uh, sorry, a permissive license. Uh, tracking ended up being not too good, uh, unfortunately. Uh, on, up to this day, it's still very unreliable. You can use it with Monado, but uh, it's very unreliable. It's difficult to get sensors working well with it. Orphan 3. Orphan 3 is GPL. Uh, wasn't our first choice just because of it being GPL. But um, it is the state of the art, uh, at least in the sense that SLAM uh, research goes. There is kind of like a standard metrics and standard data sets. And with those metrics and with those data sets, Orphan 3 is top notch. It's like always the best in general, at least in the latest uh, papers that have come out uh, up to this point. Um, we were avoiding it just because of the license. But we basically had a fork of Monaro into this to just check out how it worked. And indeed, we got some tracking working. Uh, it did have some problems that we wa weren't aware of, of until we integrated a new system, but uh, it worked pretty well. And if you're interested in Northland 3, they have, uh, like in the readme, you can see that they have commercial options. Like you can, they have commercial options to change the license if you're interested in that. And finally, Basalt, which was kind of like the system we settled on, uh, is developed by the Technical University of Munich. And it works really well. Uh, it, it lacks some features. We were, uh, I basically wasn't, I, I didn't try it at first, basically because it just support one sensor configuration, which is stereo and an IMU. Uh, but Jacob recommended it to me uh, to try it again. Uh, I mean, he mentioned the system to me again, and so I, I gave it a go after integrating Chimera and Northland 3. And indeed, it was really good. Like, it feels really good, and it's very stable. It has good uh, documentation, good CI, pretty good code quality. Doesn't crash as much. Trust me, it doesn't crash, crash as much, even though it seems it does. Um, things are worse in other places. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of like what we have in Monaro right now. There were other systems that were considered. Uh, some honorable mentions would be uh, if VIO. Uh, OpenVINs, DM, VIO, OCVIS2, and SVO Pro are kind of like five systems that look pretty good, but we didn't implement for some reason or another. And I'll link to a repository that uh, is kind of recent. I'm trying to put down my thoughts on reasons why I pick or don't pick uh, particular systems uh, in that repository. So you can read that and even contribute to that if you feel like it. Okay, so Basalt was kind of like the clear winner, uh, you can say. Uh, there are some metrics in the blog post, I'm linking it a slide, uh, about why I, I choose Basalt in general. But yeah, it, it's basically, it was uh, fast, a lot faster, trajectories felt smoother, felt a lot better. Uh, there is also another blog post uh, uh, talking about the feeling of the trajectories, which is interesting, which kind of uh, focuses on why Basalt feels better and why uh, that feeling better is not well represented with current slum, current slum metrics and how we need to do better metrics for XR. But in general, uh, work pretty well. Uh, Vladislav Osenko and Nikolaus Demel, which are the main maintainers of Basalt, were very responsible. Like, we had uh, plenty of discussions of dif on different topics of Basalt on how to improve it for XR. So I'm super glad uh, that they were so responsible and super thankful to them. And it also has few external dependencies, few external depend dependencies which is awesome. But it's also listed in the bad parts. Uh, so having few external dependencies is super good, but that's uh, so so that you get an idea. OpenCV is only used in one call uh, for feature detection. It's the only thing they use OpenCV for in the VIO pipeline. Everything else, optical flow, uh, whatever you use, uh, image manipulation, everything else is is implemented in Basalt, and even. The optimization, uh, like the main optimization, like the, the, the main factor graph optimization, is also implemented by hand in Basalt. Uh, this is kind of unusual. Uh, Option 3, for example, uses uh, the, uh, the G2O framework, and Chimera uses the GTSAM framework. Basalt does it by hand. Again, I think this is good because uh, it shows how, uh, how well they know what they're doing. And it probably has some performance benefits, but it is also uh, something to keep in mind because it's more code to maintain if, if we uh, want to maintain it eventually. Um, it is not a full real-time slum pipeline. The, 
you just get uh, vision and short uh for now, at least in real time. They have a, a bundle adjustment that integrates the entire map, but it runs only offline, and we, sh we need to work on integrating that into the real time pipeline. But for now, we don't have that, so it tends to drift over time. Like after some time of operation, you will notice that you're in a different position virtually than from where you started physically. Uh, it had and still has some problems with non-overlapping cameras, and it only supports one uh, sensor configuration, which is stereo with IMU, compared to Arflan 3, for example, which supports a lot of uh, different sensor configurations. Okay, regarding the basalt pipeline, I will not talk about, the, about it. Uh, basically, it is not that, uh, I mean, you probably don't want to hear from me <laughs> about that, and, you, and the paper already does a very good job explaining it. If you just read the introduction, you will get a very good picture about it. Uh, it's probably not worth for me to talk about it in this talk. I might talk a bit about it uh, for the demos, but not that much. The Monaro architecture, on the other hand, is probably more interesting, like if you need to implement a new device and try to use or slam stuff. Uh, the, remember, this is not just Basalt, but any other system we might integrate in the future, or Orphan 3 or Chimera. The, so the pipeline in Monado looks something like this. We have an OpenXR application that requests a pause at a particular point in time. And on the other hand, we have the physical device that is streaming IMU and camera samples uh, to Monado. So we usually have some kind of hardware interface, like if we are use, uh, doing low level stuff, like in the reverse engineering drivers, we will use just lib USB, but we might have like the real sense SDK if we're using real sense or the depth AI SDK if we're using that AI cameras. Uh, this goes into the, the device driver. The device driver usually has a, a frame server or source of data that can stream IMU and can stream uh, frames. These frames go into what we call the slam tracker, which is basically a wrapper that has all the functionality that is generic enough to any SLAM system. It is implemented in Monado. It has things like prediction, filtering, uh, extrapolation, and things like, uh, sorry, interpolation, and, and, and things like that, and, and some debug utilities. Uh, so there are some data things here that the frame server streams to, and uh, these data things redirect the camera and the IMU streams into this uh, SLAM header. This is just a header file, a C++ header file, that I designed as I went, so it has some problems, I will talk about them uh, in a moment. But basically it's just a header file that in Monado we only have the header file and we have the implementation in, uh, in a fork of the SLAM system. This implementation is just uh, uh, something that knows how to interact with the, with the entry points and the output points of the, of the SLAM system uh, itself. Um, and then you get the post back. You usually get a post for each frame you send, and you just get the post back. You do some prediction, uh, some IMU integration, because you want to keep using the IMU data, that the latest IMU da data on top of the latest uh, estimation from the system. And there is also some filtering for smoothing the trajectory, but that's usually disabled because it adds latency and it's not like it's probably usually not worth it to add filtering on, on top of that, and then go back to the device to the OpenX runtime, and eventually it goes to the application, and the application know, uh, can know where it's located. Okay, uh, let me see. Okay, so the I will talk briefly about this. This is uh, the main idea of the Slam Tracker header, like. Uh, the main thing that goes here are these three methods, uh, which are basically being able to push an IMU sample, push frames, and then being able to dequeue the, the estimated poses from the slum system. This is what Monaro uses internally. And in general, uh, there's none of the forks are restricted to Monaro, so technically you could use them. Uh, you could use the, the forks uh, with this uh, with this header in any other project. Um, the thing that I want to point out is that. This re-implementation uh, of being able to, to recognize the entry points of the different systems or of being able to recognize the output, uh, where the outputs are and, and how to wire them together to get useful interfaces has been solved so many times for, from so many different people. Elixir needs to do the same thing. Uh, Slam Bench needs to do the same thing. Gia Slam needs to do the same thing. And I know at least three other people that needed to basically do the same thing as this, which is basically uh, spend weeks just seeing how to get pose, how to get camera images, IMU samples, and how to output pulses from the systems. 
It would be awesome to have a standard for this, and we talked a bit uh, uh, with this. Uh, uh, we talked a bit about this with the Elixir Consortium, but for me at least, or for Monaro at least, it's probably too soon to standardize, standardize this. Um, right now, this interface has some issues like using uh, OpenCV matrix as the frame input and stuff like that. So in general, I, this uh, interface is still very prototypical, uh, but a standard would be awesome at some point in the future so that new SLAM systems can implement this standard and uh, be automatically automatically supported in Slam Bench, Elixir, Monaro, etc. Okay, so uh, some drivers are supported. I will probably not go into too much detail because of time, but yeah, the first uh, driver was the RealSense uh, driver, uh, basically the uh, D455 camera. This is kind of like a T265, just it doesn't do a Slam inside the device. Technically, we should be able to use the T265. Uh, and compare our slam to the T265 slam, but uh, I haven't had the chance yet. Uh, then the first headset uh, I implemented, thanks a lot uh, to Thetan for the reverse engineering work and to, for helping me with, uh, with it at the time, uh, was uh, with the Odyssey Plus, in particular for the window measurability driver in general. So right now, any uh, window measurability headset should work with instead of tracking, of course, uh, it should be tested and, and probably some tweaks should be done, but in general it works. The Rift S, as uh, Jan Schmidt commented today, Thetan, uh, earlier this morning, uh, yeah, Rift, Rift S works now since like less than a month. Uh, that, is that driver is integrated into Monaro and so, and today was the first time I, I saw uh, here in FOSXR uh, the uh, Rift S working with, the, with this slam, that was amazing. Uh, Valve Index, I recently implemented some partial uh, version of the inter of, of inside out tracking with the Valve Index. It's still not uh, super polished, but it's kind of cool. Like you can now use uh, Valve Index without lighthouses and get tracked, which is pretty cool, I think. And Depth AI, uh, for Northstar, this was implemented by Moses here in FOSXR. Uh, and here in FOSXR, I also saw for the first time a Northstar running this slam, uh, the, this inside out tracking, which again was awesome. Finally, there is an EUROG driver. Uh, for some reason, it's a driver, but it's basically, EUROG is a standard dataset format, and it's very useful. Like, if you're planning to implement a device, you should probably check out the EUROG driver uh, to see how to do datasets to test the, that the samples you have are, are, are good enough or, or will work on, a, on our SLAM uh, systems. Okay, now it's uh, show time. Let's see if this works. Okay, so Moses has uh, lent me uh, for a bit his uh, their Nordstar. Um, this so in Force XR was the first time I I was uh, I I had the opportunity to test this. Let's see if uh, this works. Uh -huh. Yes. And yes. Oh, I didn't notice this. Okay. Thanks. Just, just wait a second. Don't start. Sorry. Don't start. I did it. Uh, okay. I, I did it while you were doing this. You have to start the demo app well after you start the demo. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay, cool. And pass it this. Okay. Uh, Okay, so yes, it's working. Let's put this on. Okay, okay, are, are you seeing thing, everything yep. great? Awesome. So yeah, we are running here the uh, some stereo kit application uh, with the no with the Northstar headset uh, using a depth AI camera, and this is running Basalt. And as you can see. Uh, basically, we have positional tracking and rotational tracking, which is everything we want. Um, and I can inspect things, and hand tracking works as well. Of course, the, the hand tracking was uh, presented today. 
and things are working and everything is free, permissively licensed and running totally open source and in Monado. So I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess that's it for the demo. <laughs> yes. yes, I, oh yeah, yeah, I want to show that. Yeah, so let's see uh, the basalt, basalt UI. So what is happening here? Uh, let's see. Uh, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, okay. So, do you see... Okay, so here we have the camera streams of these two cameras. And the cameras are basically uh, detecting different points of interest in, this, in the 2D images. Those 2D images, uh, th th that gets done via feature, feature detection. And then those, uh, the, the different features get uh, paired between the two cameras with, through feature matching. And that feature matching that detection, you can then triangulate into 3D points that you can see here, hopefully. Uh, oh no. Oh no. Okay, I maybe had me a mouse. Oh no. Oh. Okay, oh. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Kind of, okay. There are some blue points in the 3D view that hopefully you're seeing. Those are the features triangulated into 3D. And uh, with that information, together with the IMU data, uh, everything gets integrated into the bundle adjustment optimization, which is basically a nonlinear optimizer running Levember Marquardt, Levember, Levember Marquardt optimizer. Uh, that is basically doing everything and estimating the pose, finally. As you can see, there are some blue cameras, uh, some blue kind of frames that are in the kind of like letting a trail. Uh, so I mentioned Basalt was a VIO pipeline, so it doesn't have uh, permanent information of the map. That means it only keeps a map for the last seven keyframes it is seeing. So what this means is that, for example, if we are running the, okay, let's see how we're still running. I will run the application again to show you something which is kind of like one of the problems of Basalt. So uh, now it works pretty well. The problem is that if I like make the cameras, uh, if, if I block the cameras and move, as you can see, uh, okay, let's see. I'm blocking the cameras, so there are no features. We are drifting because of the IMU stuff. And we're in the f same physical spot, but the things have drift. I mean, it's recovering because, okay, I didn't, okay, it's recovering because I didn't let enough time pass uh, for the keyframes to get lost. But you get kind of like the idea. You get drift, you drift a bit, and then... Okay, I lost it. I, like, the panels are in other place that they shouldn't be. Okay, you get the idea. That is kind of like the main problem we have with Basalt right now. Uh, but in general, it works pretty well. Uh, I mean, for the normal way of operation, it works pretty well. And, okay. Cool. I'll let some videos. Can you stop? Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it might have said that uh, that was it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm being told that uh, there is a memory leak here, so I should. I needed to stop one out. Uh, okay. Uh, so I let so I'll let some videos in the slide of other headsets, uh, other devices working. Uh, the Real Sense uh, camera, Samsung Galaxy Plus, and the Valve Index. Uh, if you're interested in those. And, okay, how much time do I have left? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so, after seeing the demo, what I want to talk about is more uh, directed towards people that want to use the, the underlying inside-out tracking for new devices. Um, so I just kind of like give recommendations as stuff to watch out for. So, the first thing, for uh, the first recommendation I have for you is to use the Eurog recorder and player utilities that are in Monado. Eurog, again, is a data set that can record images and IMU data. So if you're able to record the data of your device and play back the data and the tracking looks good, then you are most of the way, kind of, like into getting a, a usable system, a usable device with inside out tracking. So that's kind of like the first step you should be doing. Uh, then, things that you need to consider in general are uh, you will need to have calibration data. You will need to have uh, the calibration data. Basically, you have the extrinsics of the, of the sensors, which are the different 
the poses relative to each other between the IMU and the cameras and, and between the, each camera. Uh, and also the intrinsics of each uh, device, of each sensor model, like you have the, camera the different camera models, you will need the, the parameters for those camera models, and the IMU model, you will need the parameters for that IMU model. There's only support for one type of IMU model, but it's uh, fairly common. I haven't seen any other IMU model out there, so it probably, will probably work for you. Um, shutter type. So the shutter of your camera should be global. Uh, that means you shouldn't have, uh, like all the pixels should be taken at the same time. Uh, otherwise, you will get uh, like the, the rolling shutter effect. I didn't put an image, but it's basically when you have uh, some things that are moving very fast, they will get distorted and that distortion will destroy SLAM uh, for fast movement. So you don't want a rolling shutter in general. Uh, exposure and gain adjustment. So you don't want your images to be overexposed or underexposed. They need to be in the perfect, uh, in the perfect level of the histogram, of the color histogram. Uh, if you have the possibility to ad adjust exposure and gain of your camera, there is an auto exposure and gain module implemented in Monaro that should help with, should help with that, and it's being used in Rift S and in Windows Reality drivers. Uh, you might need to tune some tables of values, but it should work. Um, the camera and the enemy frequencies, uh, you should aim probably for 30 FPS to 60 FPS camera, uh, for the camera images, and for the IMU, the IMU, it doesn't matter that much, but we usually use between 200 and 1,000 uh, hertz, at least the drivers that are working right now. Um, something that is worth mentioning is that basalt is pretty fast, so it will handle pretty well, like 60 frames per second, and it will improve significantly the tracking at the cost, of course, of more processing power uh, being needed. So the trade-off there, you will need to do it based on your, on the computer power, you, the computing power you have, and the sensors you have. Um, unified IMU measurements. So hopefully you don't have an accelerometer and a gyroscope in separate streams. Hopefully they are in the same uh, stream and unified. Otherwise you will need to do uh, some interpolation there that because I'm lazy, I didn't, uh, I ended up not implementing Monaro. It should be easy to implement, but it's not there. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Um, hardware clock synchronization. Yes, you will need all of your clocks to be pretty well synchronized inside the device. Uh, the exposure, the two frames you get from each camera should have the same timestamp each time, and that the clock of that timestamp should be the same in the same clock as the IMU, uh, as, the, as the IMU sample. So you will need uh, a device that has clock synchronization, of course. And uh, another clock synchronization you need is being able to sing, uh, know the offset between the hardware clock and the host computer clock. There are some tools in Monaro to help with that, uh, but they are still not perfect, uh, but they are there and they kind of work decently enough. And lastly, or kind of lastly, but more annoying is our coordinate spaces. Uh, there are too many coordinate spaces uh, in a system like this. You have the sensor coordinate spaces, you have the IMU measurement coordinate space, you have the SLAM system coordinate space, you have OpenXR coordinate space, you'll deal, need to deal with that. Oh, and you also have the, oh no, I said that, I said that already. Okay, you will have a lot of coordinate spaces and we are hoping to, basically the idea for the future, right now it doesn't work like this, but the idea for the future is to have uh, sufficient tools to transform all of the drivers, all of the internals of the drivers to OpenXR and so that we can ensure that the SLAM system gets, gets OpenXR coordinates, uh, coordinates, like OpenXR formatted coordinate stuff, so that we can also output uh, OpenXR poses. Uh, for, for now, we don't have that, and it's a very manual and tedious process, unfortunately. And lastly, you hopefully you have an IMU to ICE transform, because otherwise, uh, it depends the headset, but for example, for the Valve Index, we don't really have that uh, very well, and like the, the thing we have is not very precise and it feels off, like uh, because the SLAM systems uh, estimate the pose of the IMU, you will need to be able to correct uh, to your eyes for, for the view to look okay. Okay, uh, contributions. So some contributions that came out of this, uh, to the contributions to Basalt in particular, that came out of, of this work that made things work a bit better, uh, were uh, the 
basically, Windows Mesh already had a camera model that is a bit weird. It's similar to OpenCV, but it's not exactly that. And it wasn't supported by Basalt. And so I, I tried to implement it and upstream, uh, and upstream it to, Bas to Basalt. Uh, this merge request was opened like for a couple of months. And this, the reason of this because it was because it had a very weird problem. Uh, so this camera model is not injective, meaning that if you're seeing a 3D point here and you project the 3D point into 2D, you start moving around uh, in 3D, the point moves around in 2D in the camera, but at some point it falls back into itself. And that means basically this point can be projected uh, like here or here, like uh, it has more than one, than one point uh, that we can go into. And that's super annoying because that makes some points uh, not, not work. In the commercial solution, or at least for factory, window materiality calibration data comes with a, with a thing called metric radius, which basically describes the ra a radius in which the model should be injected. But we didn't have this in Basalt, and we also, I mean, it would have been nice to, it would be a good idea to, like, if we're upstreaming this, it should support any other camera that has this, this model. So something interesting, interesting that happened be, uh, while the merge request was opened was that some people from Kidware released, released a paper uh, addressing that exact same issue and, and bringing, uh, bringing attention to this issue that hasn't been really discussed before, or at least the paper claimed it, wasn't, it hasn't been uh, discussed before. And they solved the issue for a simple model with just three parameters. And I was able to grab the paper and extend the extend it to solve the issue for our eight parameter model. So that was pretty cool. Like I kind of felt like, oh, we, I'm doing research. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Um, okay, and then the, three minutes, okay. Oh, three minutes. Okay, I will not talk about the next one. Uh, let's just go to the conclusions. Um, sorry, the, the contribution, the, the second contribution was just basically a better feature like better features for the right camera. Basalt has some, had some problems with non-overlapping cameras. I just improved that. And okay, conclusion, conclusions and future work. Uh, the nice thing about all of this is that we have now some headsets working in a totally open source stack, uh, getting tracked and working. Uh, that is kind of cool. Uh, it's very cool, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. um, there is, don't get your, ha your hopes too high. There is a lot of work to, uh, to get closer to commercial solutions. Uh, keep that in mind when you use this, but we have something. Um, my plan right now uh, is to fix the rough edges as soon as I can, like add more documentations, fix crashes, fix usability issues. Uh, I've been like delaying this, uh, these kind of things, but I think it's like enough people are starting to use this so that it should, I should probably uh, focus more on that. So I'll do it. <laughs> um, the next thing I want to do is uh, to keep improving basalt, basalt. It has been a very good system as of now, and I think uh, it's a very good baseline to start working on top of, to also understand better the problem. I'm not yet an expert <laughs> by far of that on SLAM. Uh, this is a very big field and uh, kind of complex in some ways. So Basal is a very nice way to start off from something that works pretty well and start implementing and trying ideas and learning from that. And Meanwhile, we will still keep looking for new systems that come out and be prepared for integrating new systems into Monado every now and then that, that might be worth integrating. Some things that are very cool is that there is uh, an entire pipeline of metrics implemented in Monado right now. Uh, you can see the XRT Slam metrics repository. Basically, we have a pipeline for measuring uh, different aspects of the, of the pipeline, the accuracy, the performance, and, and stuff like that which is very useful for implementing, like the two features, I uh, the two contributions I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, I was able to say, okay, yes, these, con these contributions are really improving uh, things and that helps uh, upstreaming stuff and that helps uh, like being sure that what you're doing is improving things. Uh, tracking sometimes is a bit uh, subjective how it feels, so it's good to have metrics. But we need more metrics for XR. Like uh, right now we're using metrics that come from like the regular metrics. We need a lot of work for, to get uh, metrics that are specific for XR that really represent the feeling of the user, that represent the, the, the I don't know, the wobbliness, the, fun, the ghost effects, like all of these things that we experience with tracking is, uh, is not working well. We need metrics for, to, repre to represent these issues. 
um, we also need data sets. Like the data sets we were using were uh, from the standard data sets, uh, but they don't really represent the XR usage. And we are kind of working on, it, on doing data sets with lighthouses specific for VR. That's why the Valve Index now has SLAM. And at some point, I will, like, once I have those data sets, I will publish them to the community because I think uh, those don't exist, like, in general. Uh, and I think that will be a good contribution. And in the midterm future, I guess, uh, there are many things I want to do in, in, in Basalt or in the system, in whatever system. Things like handle the dynamic objects, like when you're, like when you're in a room and things are static, it's, uh, it works pretty well. But as soon as someone enters into the room or you start putting your hands on, uh, in the cameras, things get crazy, uh, which is annoying. Like we should really detect uh, dynamic objects and handle them in some way. Synthetic data sets, I think, would be amazing at some point. Even having a tool that integrates SLAM synthetic data sets with hand tracking synthetic data sets could be very useful at some point. Um, I'm thinking at some point also having a joint bundle adjustment with hand tracking, for example, or with like having a, a very big optimizer that does everything, I think would be very useful to have. Uh, it's probably a bad idea to have the different optimize, different tracking uh, things separate in the sense like at least we would get a lot more information and a, and a lot better uh, uh, accuracy if we integrated all of the tracking in some good way that was uh, modular enough. And uh, online calibration would be amazing. Like uh, right now, calibration is, is tricky. Like you can, you need to rely on the vendor providing the calibration data or you're out of luck and you need to calibrate yourself, which is annoying. Even though Basalt has a nice calibration tool, but it's still annoying. Um, so the last word is that the infrastructure is there, I think. Uh, we have the entire pipeline. We just need to keep iterating on it and keep improving on it and getting the tracking being to be better. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, and we are hiding, of course. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Pretty impressive work. Uh, we have time for one question. One question. Who wants to right here in the audience? Um, Hi, I'm Moses. I'm the hand tracking person. Um, Hello. For, for people watching at home, um, so you said the joint hand tracking optimizer. One question: um, Are there how many different optimization things are you doing in Slam, and how often do you run them? Like once per frame, once per IMU sample? One per frame, yes, one per frame, and the IMU the IMU stuff gets pre-integrated for each frame. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> That was a short one. We have time for another one. If uh, and let me check on the on the channel. Okay, there's one here from Ryan, and we'll wrap this up. So, so when you were showing off how it kind of loses track and drifts because it doesn't keep very many keyframes, um, is it doing sort of a form of loop closure in sort of those past seven keyframes, or does yeah. it not really have a concept of loop closure? It does have a concept of loop closure, but what happens is that having those seven keyframes gives you a map, so you can, like, if you are still seeing the same points of that map, you can re be uh, be aware and and be able to place back, but as soon as the last keyframes go away, uh, like, you lose that map and you won't get that nice uh, going back again. So there was no explanation to put that. Um. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I invite you, if you have more questions, to um, ask online or you know, physically. I mean, we've got Matteo here in Minneapolis. So um, thank you again for all of your very good work and today. So um, take care, and we'll catch up later. All right. Thank you. That's awesome. You did great. Thanks.